Welcome to our online service. In line with the theme, Empty Tomb, Everything Transformed, we will be reading scriptures and singing songs about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's worship the Lord as only He deserves. Mark 16 verse 6 says, Don't be alarmed, He said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Shall we sing this song? Up from the grave he arose. And I always smile at this one verse that says, Vainly they watch his bed, Jesus my Savior. Vainly they seal the dead, Jesus my Lord, because they couldn't seal him in, could they? Because he came alive again. Bible says in Revelation 1 verses 17 to 18, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forevermore. This next song we're going to sing is more or less a uh, kids church song because a lot of times we sing it at kids church but it's a really fun song that talks about how jesus is alive alive forever more Jesus is a 
Romans 6 verse 9 says, For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. He is our Savior, Redeemer. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same because you came new. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only Son. Cause you lived and you died and you rose again on high. You opened the way for the world to live again. Hallelujah for all you've done. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me comforting to know that because uh, because he lives I can face an uncertain tomorrow God sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love heal and forgive he lived and died Oh, 
Isn't it a great joy meeting on this online platform week after week and being able to praise the Lord, study His Word together and also in so many ways intercede in His presence for one another. Before we look at God's Word this morning, let's just pause for a moment of prayer. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed this morning, I'm going to lead you in a word of prayer. And as I lead you in this word of prayer, what is beautiful is that wherever you are this morning, you can cry out to God. You can praise Him this morning for what He's done in your life. But at the same time, you can cry out to God as one family, wherever we are in our own homes. Let's cry out to Jesus this morning. God, work in our lives your most beautiful purposes to fulfill. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you because you are high and exalted. Your trains fill the temple. We thank you this morning because you are omnipotent God. You are omniscient God. You are omnipresent God. We thank you this morning that you remind us, I will never leave you even to the end of the age. Thank you, Heavenly Father, this morning that your word reminds us that you are sovereign Lord. Our sovereign Lord, is there anything too hard for you? Thank you, Lord, that your word reminds us that you own the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. We want to bless your holy name. Thank you that your word reminds reminds us that you are holy God. Thank you that your word reminds us that you are merciful God. Thank you that your word reminds us that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. Thank you that your word reminds us that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. And so, Lord, this morning, thinking of who you are, we come before you and we bow down in your presence and we say, worthy art thou, worthy art thou, King of kings and Lord of lords. We praise you, we worship you, we adore you and we bless you. Lord, this morning, along with your people all around this country and maybe even in different parts of the world, we praise you for what you have done in our lives. Lord, in our lives, we have experienced your mercy and grace and we want to return to you thanks and praise this morning and say to you, blessed be your holy name. Oh, for your protection, we thank you. Oh, for your presence, we thank you. Oh, for your power, we thank you. Oh, for your provisions, we thank you. Oh, for your goodness, we thank you. Oh, for your mercy, we thank you. Oh, for the victories in our life, we thank you, O oh God. Blessed be your holy name. And God, this morning as we thank you, we pray for one another, O oh God. How we thank you that you are all-powerful God, one to whom nothing is impossible. And this morning as I pray for people as they are crying out, thank you for the promise of your word that when two people on the earth agree concerning anything and ask, the Father in heaven will grant, O oh God. And so as your people cry out, I cry for them this morning. Lord, those that need healing, would you heal them this morning? Those that need restoration, would you restore them this morning? morning. Those that are defeated, would you make them victorious this morning? Those that are depressed, would you bring peace upon them this morning? Lord, I pray in a mighty way, move among us your purposes to fulfill. Lord, for that person who has been crying out to you, God, would you please satisfy the desires of my heart? Would you answer that prayer this morning, oh God? For that person who's been crying out to you for a job, would you give them that job, oh God? For that person who's been crying out to you saying, God, would you heal me in this particular area would you bring healing in their life this morning God this morning our biggest prayer is this draw all of us closer to yourself God we want to walk with you all the days of our life and Lord this morning as we quieten our hearts to listen to your voice speak to us in ways in which only you can Lord Lord may the resurrection of Jesus be real to us as we look at your word this morning we ask that we would experience the power of the resurrection in our life because Lord, your word says the same power that the Father used to bring Jesus back to life is available for us as your children. Lord, we want to know the power of the resurrection in our lives. And so be honored, Lord, be glorified. For we ask with a grateful heart in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. As we turn in our Bibles to 1st Corinthians chapter 15, I'm sure you remember our theme for this particular series. Empty tomb, everything transformed. As I study 1st Corinthians chapter 15, I I learn four primary lessons that the apostle Paul is teaching the church at Corinth and teaching each one of us. Number 1, the apostle Paul talks of the definiteness of the resurrection. The second lesson that I learn from this particular chapter is the defense of the resurrection. He not only talks about the definiteness of the resurrection the apostle Paul goes into great detail to defend the resurrection the third lesson that i pick up from 1st corinthians chapter 15 is the description of the resurrection paul will talk about the bodily resurrection of the believer he describes our bodily resurrection and number 4 Paul says once you've understood the resurrection you live a life of devotion because Christ the Lord is risen the definiteness of the resurrection the defense of the resurrection the description of our resurrection the devotion because of the resurrection you will remember last week We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 down to verse 11. In this particular passage, the apostle Paul talks about the definiteness of the resurrection. You remember, I said to you, Paul says, there are three reasons why I believe in the resurrection beyond the shadow of any doubt. Number 1, the resurrection is talked about in the word of God. The Old Testament prophesied it, Jesus spoke about it, and you find fulfillment in the resurrection. The resurrection is a reality, it is a definite truth. Number 1, because the word of God presents it to us. Number 2 the apostle Paul says because of the witnesses that talked about it the apostles the 500 James the disciples he talks about the witnesses credible witnesses who talk about the resurrection so number 1 he says the resurrection is a reality because it is the fulfillment of the word number 2 he says the resurrection is a reality because credible witnesses is not just one or two but hundreds of them their life transformed they are willing to lay their lives down this resurrection is an absolute absolute reality and thirdly the apostle paul says think about god's work in my life from a persecutor i become a preacher you know why because the resurrection is a living reality in my life all the word of god the witnesses of god and the work of god in my life says the apostle paul today we begin to start looking at the second lesson that paul teaches in first corinthians chapter 15 which is the defense of the resurrection we'll continue looking at the same theme when we come back next week this is part 1 of paul's defense of the resurrection what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 down to verse 20 I'm going to read this passage for you right now and as I read this passage for you as we do every week let's pull out our pens and our papers begin to make notes what is the apostle Paul talking about in this particular section of the scriptures 1 Corinthians chapter 15 I'm reading to you verses 12 down to verse 20 this is what the apostle Paul says but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised and if Christ has not been raised our preaching is useless and so is your faith more than that we are found to be false witnesses about god for we have testified about god that he raised christ from the dead but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised 
Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, as you look at this particular section of the scripture, I don't know about you, but I see Paul talking about three very important lessons. Number one, the Apostle Paul is talking about how there are some people in the context of Corinth who are denying the truth. So first lesson is the denial of the truth. There are some who are denying the truth. What truth are they denying? They're denying the truth of the resurrection. Number two, the Apostle Paul says, when you deny the truth of the resurrection, it results in the destruction of the truth. He says, the entire gospel of Jesus Christ just falls flat if the resurrection did not happen. So lesson one is the denial of the truth. Lesson two is the destruction of the truth. But what is beautiful is that Paul in many ways ends this section by talking about the most delightful truth. The most delightful truth. So as I look at this particular section, I see Paul talking about those who are trying to deny the truth. He says when they deny the truth, it results in the destruction of the truth. But he finishes this section by saying, I want to tell you that this is the most delightful truth. Jesus is risen again. Verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Very quickly, let's look at those three lessons together. Number one, the denial of the truth. I want you to begin to look with me at a few verses. We're going to read verse 12, verse 13, and verse 16. In verse 12, the apostle Paul says, but if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, then note what he says, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? So the apostle Paul is saying there are some in the context of the church at Corinth who are saying there is no resurrection of the dead. And why are they saying this? They are saying this because Greek philosophy has constantly yearned for something. What have they yearned for? They yearned for the day when death comes so that the soul of man can be liberated from the prison of the body. But now when we preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we preach the resurrection of the dead, all Greek philosophers hate the resurrection of the dead. And so what Paul is saying, there are some among you who are saying there is no resurrection of the dead. Now look with me at verse 13. In verse 13 he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead. So he finishes verse 12 by saying, there are some of you who say there is no resurrection of the dead. Verse 13 he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead. And then if you would come down with me to verse 16. In verse 16 he says, but if the dead are not raised. So as you look at these three verses, you realize that Paul is talking about a challenge that the Corinthian believer is faced with, a challenge within the context of the Corinthian church. What is that challenge? The challenge is that there are some who are denying the resurrection of the dead. And the Apostle Paul says, the moment you deny the resurrection of the dead, it results in a complete destruction of the entire gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no more gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no more faith. We are to be pitied above everything else. So he begins by talking to us. He begins by talking to the church at Corinth saying, listen, there are those who are trying to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One of the things that Satan and his forces try to do is that they try to bring doubts in the minds of people about the resurrection. They try to discredit the resurrection 
And in fact, when you read about the resurrection of Jesus, on the day Jesus rose again, you see how the evil one is trying to convince people that the resurrection is not true. Look with me at your Bible. We're at Matthew chapter 28. The Bible talks about how the guards went to the city. We're at verse 11. They went to the city and they reported everything that had happened. What had just happened? They'd, they'd experienced and they had seen the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verse 12, the Bible says, When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples, Disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. And I don't know about you, every time I read that verse, I laugh to myself because that is such a lie. What did they ask them to tell people? Oh, his disciples came and stole him while we were asleep. How did you know? Who came and stole him if you were asleep? But as you look at that particular passage of scripture, one of the things that is absolutely clear is that from the moment of Christ's resurrection, the evil one has done all he can to put doubts in the minds of people, to try and discredit the resurrection and to do all he can to convince people that the resurrection of Jesus Christ never took place. And the moment he convinces people that the resurrection never took place, then our entire faith is absolutely futile. I want to place before you six theories, six theories that the evil one has used down through the centuries to try and discredit the resurrection. Number one is the fraud theory. What is the fraud theory? His disciples invented the resurrection. Number two is the swoon theory. What's the swoon, swoon theory? Christ merely fainted and when they put him in a cool tomb, he revived and he did not rise from the dead. He simply revived from his injuries. Number three is the vision theory. His disciples imagined that they saw him. Jesus did not rise again. His disciples simply imagined that he rose again. Number four is the spirit theory. Only his spirit rose. There was no bodily resurrection. Only the spirit of Jesus Christ rose. Number four, Five is the heart theory or oh, the resurrection is only in the heart of the disciples of Jesus Christ. It never happened. And number six is the tomb theory. Right through the centuries, there are people who point to different tombs and say this is the tomb of Jesus Christ. One of the most recent tombs, tomb discoveries was the Talpiot tomb, the Talpiot tomb. People said this is the tomb of Jesus Christ and we've even found bones of Jesus Christ. We're going to do DNA to prove that this, this was Jesus Christ. But stop and think about it. Every single attempt from the evil one is to do all he can to deny the truth of the resurrection because the evil one knows that if you deny the truth of the resurrection, then our entire faith is futile. So as Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers, he's saying, number one, I want to point out to you that there are those who are trying to deny the truth, the denial of the truth. I'm sure many of you have heard about Robert Ingersoll. Who was this man? He was an agnostic, a man that tried to disprove the existence of God. And one of the things that he would do in many of his talks was to try and discredit the resurrection. And so one day in his, in his talk, he was trying to discredit the resurrection of Lazarus. And so he said to the audience, when Jesus was going down in popularity, he actually had to stage the resurrection of Lazarus. And in that particular talk, he asked the audience a question. He said, think about it. Why would Jesus have had to say, Lazarus, come forth? Lazarus come forth because what Ingersoll was hoping to communicate to his audience was that Jesus was saying Lazarus come forth and not just come forth because this was a sign for Lazarus to come out of the tomb. So he asked the audience why did Jesus say Lazarus come forth? And it seems there was an old lady, she immediately got up and she spoke up at the top of her voice and she said, Mr. Ingersoll, if Jesus had simply said come forth, Every single tomb in Bethany would have been empty. Everybody would have come back out of their graves 
and would have been alive. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth, because he was simply calling Lazarus back to life or the evil one down through the centuries has done his level best to try and deny the truth of the resurrection so number one the apostle paul talks about the denial of the truth the second lesson that we learn from this section is the apostle paul says when one denies the resurrection when one denies the bodily resurrection then what it results in is the destruction of the truth. And if you read this particular passage carefully, the Apostle Paul points out seven critically important lessons. And he says, this is what happens when you deny the bodily resurrection. Number one, he says, when you deny the bodily resurrection, you deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 13 and verse 16. If there is no res resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Look at verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. So he's saying, please keep this in mind. There are those who are trying to deny the bodily resurrection. They are saying there is no resurrection. Please keep in mind if there is no resurrection, then not even Christ has been raised from the dead. Number two, he says, if there is no resurrection, then our preaching is useless. Our preaching is useless. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is useless. All the preaching about Jesus Christ is absolutely useless if Christ has not been raised from the dead. Number three, he says, not only is our preaching useless, our faith is useless. Our faith is useless. Verse 14, and also look with me at verse 17. In verse 14, the apostle Paul says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Then mark in your Bible, our faith is futile come with me to verse 17 and if christ has not been raised your faith is futile so number three the apostle paul says if there is no resurrection from the dead then our faith is futile number four he says the apostles are false witnesses the apostles are false witnesses look at verse 15 more than that we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. So the apostle Paul is saying, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then the apostles are false witnesses. Because the apostles are saying, we have witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are preaching to you something that we have seen, we have touched, we have experienced. So he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, the apostles are false witnesses number five he says if there is no resurrection of the dead we are still in our sins look at verse 17 and if christ has not been raised your faith is futile you are still in your sins if jesus did not rise again from the dead you are still in your sins the bible makes it very clear that when jesus died on the cross of calvary he paid the price for us on the cross of calvary and god the father validated jesus's death on the cross of Calvary by his resurrection. One of the central truths of the New Testament is that God in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead validates what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary. When Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he paid for your sin and mine. His resurrection was God's validation that the price of sin had been paid. If you look at what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1, I want to read to you beginning at verse 2. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures regarding his son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. Verse 4 is the key verse. And who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. So the apostle Paul is saying what Christ did on the cross is validated by the father in Christ's resurrection from the dead. Coming back to chapter 15, if Christ 
has not been raised from the dead, then we are still in our sins. If there is no resurrection, Christ is not raised. If there is no resurrection, our preaching is useless. If there is no resurrection, our faith is useless. If there is no resurrection, the apostles are false witnesses. If there, are, it is, if there is no resurrection, we are still in our sins. Number six, if there is no resurrection, the dead in Christ are lost forever. The dead in Christ are lost forever. Look with me at verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then the dead in Christ are lost forever. And then number seven, the apostle Paul says, if there is no resurrection, we are to be most pitied. We are to be most pitied. Look at verse 19. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are all of, we are of all people most to be pitied. We are of all people most to be pitied. So what is the Apostle Paul saying? The Apostle Paul is saying there are those who are denying the truth. What truth? They are denying the truth of the resurrection. So he says, when you deny the truth of the bodily resurrection, then it results in the destruction of the truth. And he says, please keep these seven in mind. If there is no resurrection, Christ is not raised. If there is no resurrection, our preaching is useless. If there is no resurrection, our faith is useless. If there is no resurrection, the apostles are false witnesses. If there is no resurrection, we are still in our sins. If there is no resurrection, the dead in Christ are lost. If there is no resurrection, we are to be pitied above all else. We are to be most pitied. So if you're looking at the first two lessons we're learning from this particular passage, Paul says there are those who are trying to deny the resurrection. And if you deny the resurrection, it results in the destruction of the truth. Let me share with you a true story. In 1782 in Hanover, there was a man who before he died, called his family and friends together. And he said, I want these words inscribed on my tomb. This sepulcher is purchased for eternity. Nobody is permitted to open it forever and ever. It's sealed forever because I don't believe in any resurrection. What is interesting is that this particular graveyard had to be closed for a season because of many diffi different difficulties. And when they finally opened this graveyard, when his family and friends came to see his grave, you know what had happened? Somewhere along the way when he was buried, a little seed had got into that tomb. And when they came to see it, the entire sepulcher had just been blown out because this tree had grown out and the whole tomb was broken into smitherings. All his words were fallen in letters all around and it was such a powerful reminder to people men may say what they want to say but God is on the throne Jesus is alive he is risen he is risen indeed he is king of kings and lord of lords the apostle Paul as he writes this section as he is defending the resurrection says number one please keep in mind there are those who deny the truth they say there is no body bodily resurrection. What happens if you hold on to that is that it results in the destruction of the truth. And what is beautiful is that Paul in some ways finishes this particular section by saying, let me present to you the most delightful truth. Look at verse 20. There are two lessons I want to point out for you in verse 20 as we close this morning. The most delightful truth. Verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. That's number one, the reality that Christ has been raised from the dead. Number two is the reassurance, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What is Paul talking about? He is sharing with the believers a truth that they could so easily understand. When you look at the Old Testament, one of the things that the Israelites brought to God was the first fruits of the harvest. The first fruits of the harvest was a reminder that there is much more fruit to come. As soon as the harvest is ready, this is the first fruits that ripen before the rest. Those first fruits were brought as an act of worship to God. Now what the farmer knew as he brought the first fruits is that there is much more fruit to come after that. So what is the apostle Paul saying? He says, not only do I want to 
emphasize the reality Jesus is risen, I also want to bring to you a reassurance. His resurrection is a reminder that there is many to come. Those who believe in Jesus Christ, though they die, yet they will live because he is the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the, li and the life. Those who believe in me, though they die, yet will they live. So the Apostle Paul finishes this section by saying, I want to bring to you the most delightful truth. His resurrection is a reality and it comes along with the greatest reassurance. He is the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus is risen again and the dead in Christ will rise again and have a bodily resurrection and they will be with Jesus forever and ever. What a powerful reassurance and what a powerful comfort that is to each one of us this morning. Please keep in mind that from time immemorial, from the day of Christ's resurrection, the evil one has done all he can to deny the truth of the resurrection. There are those who say there is no resurrection of the body. The Apostle Paul says, if there is no resurrection of the body, it results in the destruction of the truth. The entire gospel fades. But thanks be to God for the most delightful truth, the reality of his resurrection and the reassurance that he is the first fruit. Those who believe in Jesus Christ, though they die, yet they will live forever. There is a a bodily resurrection. We will rise again and be with Jesus forever and ever. When D.L. Moody was beginning his ministry as a young preacher, D.L. Moody was asked to speak at a funeral service. So he came back home and he pulled out his Bible and he started to flip through Matthew to John and he was trying to look for an occasion where Jesus preached at a funeral. And he looked and he looked and he looked and he looked and he couldn't find it. As he was looking at Jesus at funerals, this is what he found. He found that Jesus broke up every funeral service he attended. He found that wherever Jesus was, death could not exist. He found that whenever the dead heard the voice of Jesus, they sprang back to life. And so he came, this young preacher, and he preached. He is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him, though they die, yet will they live. He broke up every funeral service. Death cannot exist where Jesus is. When the dead heard his voice, they sprang up to life. He is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him, though they die, yet will they live. This morning, what a comfort is ours to know that the resurrection is a reality. Jesus is the first fruits. Those of us who believe in him, though we die, yet will we live. Every eye closed, every head bowed. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed this morning, what an incredible comfort the reality of his resurrection. Please keep in mind, if the dead are not raised, then we are to be pitied above all else. But praise be to God, Jesus is alive, the first fruit of those who fall asleep. What a comfort, the reality of his resurrection and the reassurance of his resurrection. Can we come to him this morning and say, God, how I thank you that Jesus is alive, that one day I would be resurrected too, that I would be with you forever and ever in glory. And this morning, let's pray for those in our family. Let's pray for those among our friends who do not believe in the resurrection, that God, the Holy Spirit will work in their hearts to bring them to that place where they would trust in Jesus and place their faith in him who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, this morning, how we rejoice, how we rejoice in the truth of your word, how we rejoice that the Apostle Paul declares Christ is indeed risen, the first fruits of the dead. What a powerful reminder that is to us, O oh God, we serve a risen Savior. And because we believe in him, though we die, yet will we live. 
how we thank you for the assurance that we have that we will meet the dead in Christ again how we have the assurance that we will be with Jesus forever and ever Lord if there is somebody that does not have that assurance this morning would you work in that heart and life your purpose is to fulfill draw them closer to yourself and Lord for each one of us help us every day this week to rejoice that we serve a risen Savior and he's in our life and our hearts today and so Lord be honored in our lives be glorified and now we pray that the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us both now and forevermore Amen